Hey there, I'm Diana Genta. Welcome to the back row, where it's always midnight and we take a new look at old school cult classics. You know, science fiction is really more than just Star Wars style shoot 'em ups. Sorry, Mark, I will always love you. Please forgive me. It's also uniquely suited to addressing the social issues of its day. And anyone who tells you otherwise doesn't know the genre. Yeah, I've said it. Science fiction has always been political. I mean, look at Asimov, Bradbury, Orwell, Collins, Pornell, Niven, Le Guin, and Fantastic Planet fits squarely into this fine tradition. A children's book cartoon with a grown-up message that almost, but not quite, undermines its escapist appeal. While Ralph Bakshi was filming boobies and racism in our last movie to create adult animation, this French and Czech collaboration was already underway, and is definitely more for grown-ups. A commercial and critical success on its release, Fantastic Planet won accolades, like the special grand prize at Cannes. But unlike most of the movies I've covered, it has not left cult status behind to become a mainstream success. If anything, it's become more obscure. So if you've never seen this movie, I am delighted to be the one to introduce you to this forgotten hit, this flawed masterpiece, the matter-of-fact psychedelia, the whimsical morality play that is Fantastic Planet. Okay. Quick note in case it turns out to be confusing. To try to get around YouTube's unwillingness to support fair use of movie footage and film criticism, I'm experimenting with all the film clips being backwards. My Barbarella review has over 100,000 views as of filming today, but I won't see a dime from it. Dickheads. Anyway, we open with a woman in rags, carrying what we assume to be her baby. The background music is what's going to be typical for this movie. Trippy, moody, appropriately otherworldly. She's running away from something. Okay, lady, your form sucks. You're gonna have to straighten up, pick up those knees if you're gonna make good time and escape. Oh, never mind. I guess you can't outrun that anyway. Whatever it is. Giant Hand torments her to exhaustion, like Mr. Hand and Mr. Bill, but European and acknowledging the pathos. It picks her up and drops her, killing her in front of the baby. The Giant Hand turns out to be just from a group of children, playing. It doesn't move. What a shame we can't play with her anymore. Right away, you're seeing almost everything that makes Fantastic Planet the exact opposite of Fritz the Cat. The animation is primitive, but the art is actually attempting to be art, and the storyline's already setting itself up to be something thought-provoking. I only say almost because there are titties. Lots of titties. But, you know, art titties. The scamps run off just before they're busted, and the baby is found by Tiva, a young drog, and her father. Despite being less emotional than the Vulcan on Quaaludes and Depression, they take pity on the poor little baby, and she's allowed to keep him as a pet. May I, father? I'll take good care of him. Very well, Tiva. We can't let the poor animal die. That was the first time I saw the drog prime minister. Is that... He saved my life and linked his fate with mine. He was unaware of this, of course, until much later. Huh. Hi, Barry. Drogs are the dominant species of the planet, which isn't the fantastic one. This is just boring old yam. Of course, you can't have your baby ohm, as they call them, interrupting your mother's meditation, so they fit him with a control collar. And we get our first view of trippy tech and additional moral satire. Now you must learn how to use it. That's fun. What will you name him? You must call him Fido or Trusty. He's a real terror. I'll call him Tear. Tear sounds like Terra, the word for Earth in French and a lot of science fiction. The drugs have a complex and orderly society, and they spend a great deal of time in meditation, which they mostly use for astral travel. Their consciousness leaves their bodies and goes to, whoops, that's a secret. Aliens, <laughs> am I right? Her dad, being prime minister, holds an interestingly public private government meeting, sort of a Zoom live stream from a locked room. It seems that some machinery has been unusually malfunctioning, possibly because ohms have been damaging it. They discuss whether or not they are intelligent enough for that, with some discussion of artifacts found on the ohms' home planet, and that they weren't smart enough to avoid destroying it. Okay. <laughs> While the art style is expressive in its formalized way, not trying to be either hyper-realistic or typically cartoony, much less animated to the extent we're used to, we are barely a step beyond clutch cargo here. It's like they had heard about animated films and set out to make a rudimentary reinvention. 
I mean, don't get me wrong, I like the idiosyncrasies of the art style, and the weird animation makes it kind of like Reading Rainbow for adults. I'm only pointing it out because I want you to think about how they went out of their way to make these particular drawings so utterly shitty to signify that they were done in-universe. It's like these people have advanced technology but don't apparently have photography or video recording. They can't even manage to work a pencil properly. What even is that? If I hadn't already seen their literal souls, I'd think they didn't have any. They decide that they need to double the amount of extermination of wild owns because they breed like... like something like rabbits that breeds really fast but not rabbits because that's cliche. Meanwhile, Tiba has lots of fun playing with Tear, though it doesn't really seem like he's having fun back. She dresses him up in fanciful outfits, teaches him tricks, and plays tricks on him, which seem at best uncomfortable, even though she isn't trying to hurt him. He's just so tiny, and she's just a kid, careless. He doesn't seem to be particularly happy, sometimes biting her or running off despite his collar. On one of his escapes, he comes across a... meditation? Um, mechanical... drug... group... hallucination? Party? dad and his buds. He's pissed, but they think it's funny. Kids sure do love their owns, don't they? Tara continues to grow, shown during a montage of hijinks, unintentional cruelty, and odd affection. He's a cuddle toy during Tiva's lessons, which are given via a headset that puts information directly into her brain. I know kung fu. Which features some truly mind-numbing facts about the planet, given with extensive invented vocabulary that Star Trek Technobabble can only jack off thinking about at night, and it's delivered in unrelenting monotone. Anchor blocks counteract the process of pontiprobation, while O'Malley globes regulate the pressure. It's like listening to my autistic kid tell me all the lore of a multiplayer video game series which neither of us has ever played, but about which she has watched extensive YouTube videos. All done without the redeeming factor of enthusiasm. A malfunction in Tara's collar allows him to learn from the lessons he's overhearing. As Tiva grows into adolescence, she plays with her toys, including Tara, less and less. So he takes the opportunity to run away, taking the headset with him. Tiva tells her mom that Tara and her headset have disappeared, and mom loses her shit telling Tiva to use the collar to drag him back from wherever he is. But if he's far away, I'll hurt him. Never mind. Put your bracelet on maximum force. They could just follow the trail he left, but whatevs. Tiva refuses to hurt Tear, so presumably Mom does it. He's dragged into a thick forest and the headset gets stuck. A wild own woman finds him and cuts off his collar, freeing him. She's wearing a fake collar, like all wild owns. It's to fool the drugs because we have seen that art savvy, the drugs are not. They have a brief conversation, and for some reason, Tara's voice here is some dork, not Barry Bostwick. I guess we all sound cooler in our own heads. She takes him back to her tribe, the Great Tree Clan, which is another excuse for more ecological phantasmagoria. Yam really is just a desert with jungle-level cruelty. Some of the best parts of this movie are the almost travelogue segments, and I really wish I could include all of them. <laughs> they live in an abandoned park in a great tree, which, let's face it, is probably just a shrub to the drugs. But this isn't the secret of Nim. A number of savage living tropes are dragged out. All the women are boobies out, the leader has crazy headgear and bombastic voice acting, the shaman is all anti-drug tech because it's a threat to his power, and they have orgiastic full moon fertility rites.
Incidentally, this is the only time the music falls flat. Wow, I have no idea what was going on without the cheesy porn sacks. Merci, Monsieur Gorgé. Tear shares the headset with some of the Savage owns, and the shaman gets his rags all in a twist and challenges him to fight for the right to share his evil knowledge. Now, we've seen earlier that Tear is kind of a pussy. Fortunately, he gets tied to an animal of combat, so it turns out okay. <laughs> He gets to go on a raid the next day to steal food from the drugs. That didn't go so well before they had someone who knew how to read what was in the boxes. <laughs> so he's actually going to be pretty useful. But first, he's got to get some proper clothes. From some creature that, frankly, seems a little too into it. Maybe they're just looking so they can know where his dick is to cover it up properly. Fortunately, some of the girls are into it too. Apparently, he's hot without the dorky duds. <laughs> they're giggling to let you know they're gonna fuck. So the men go to steal the shit, and when they're almost home, they're attacked by a rival tribe, and the food is stolen. It's a band of the hollow log. Watch out. Why do they attack us? I said their second album sounded like a drog faking an orgasm with a bird shaking tree. Also, that the hollow log was their dicks. Meanwhile, the owns are continuing to learn. And we continue having to hear it. In the third millennium before the era of Krog, legend has it that he still animates the sphere of life from his tomb, that his body is invulnerable and inalterable, although constantly transpierced by natural and artificial projectiles to combat that element of the drog spirit which seeks to die. Tara's just about to get him some with a chick who rescued him a while back when the tree comes under attack in what is perhaps cinema's most excessive cock block. This is an effective, horrifying scene, due to sound design, the design of the creature, and the events themselves. We are just termites on this huge, hostile planet. On a big screen, this would have been insane. Helpless than termites. The elves have effective weapons that take down the bird creature and kill it. Foreshadowing. And then they drink its blood. Tara gets to be prom queen. One day an ohm comes to the chief and says that he read Deomization written on the wall around the park. The drogs are finally getting around to exterminating those pesky savage ohms and they need to get out. But it's been an entire human lifetime since it was last done, and no one really takes it seriously. Well, except for the shaman, and he's been looking like a fucking idiot lately, so no one listens to him anyway. They decide to post guards in case there's trouble, and everyone gets a good night's sleep. Or gets down. Except for Tear. He goes off into the night and is captured by the band of the Hollow Log, over on the bad side of the park. He tries to explain to their leader about the deomization, but she doesn't really believe him. She sends a couple of people out to look at the wall and has him thrown into a hole. The deomization starts in the morning, and the ohms are gassed, their struggles pitiful and helpless. Especially disturbing is the use of leashed ohms in the extermination. These darker scenes are where the art style really pays off. Cartoony crap would just cheapen the tone of grim stuff like this. As it is, the movie is unflinching. When it becomes apparent what's going on, the old woman who leads the band of the hollow log frees Tara herself, and he runs off to alert his home. But he's too late. Fortunately, he finds his girlfriend, who's dragging the headset, and they meet up outside the walls of the park with some other ohms who have survived from both tribes. A couple of drogs walking by see the group, and when one of them starts stomping on them like ants, they attack. He is killed, and the other drog runs away in abject horror but the leader of the Great Tree Band has been killed. The leader of the Hollow Log Band knows of an abandoned rocket depot far away where the drogs will never find them, and vows to lead them all there. Meanwhile, the drogs have lost their minds that Ohms could be capable of killing one of them. 
They decide to DL my six times as often and even regulate the keeping of domesticated ohms because, you know, sometimes they escape and they go off to join the wild ohms. Tiva's dad doesn't say shit to this, though. He's probably thinking about Tiva's stolen headset and how ohms could have known what was in the boxes in one of the nests they discovered in the park and how quickly he can form a new identity and leave the country. I mean, Uva. Three seasons later, however long that is, the Ohms, with many more wild and domesticated ones having joined them, have built a city in the old rocket depot. The headsets have given them all the information they need to build rockets from the leftover parts, and they plan to escape to the fantastic planet, which is... Yom's moon. Not a... planet. They also upgrade their wardrobe. But before they get all the rockets made and tested, they are discovered and marked for destruction. As the new deomization with more horrific devices begins, two rockets are able to take off for Fantastic Planet. They speed past floating drug meditation bubbles and land successfully. Once there, they discover the drug's secret, and why meditation absorbs so much of their attention. See, when they meditate, they travel to Fantastic Planet, and attach to a giant statue, and other species meet up with them to do the same, and they... dance? I mean, I can't tell if this is wholesome diplomacy or erotic naked times. I mean, it is necessary for their reproduction, so... In the course of their dancing, the statues almost step on the tiny, tiny ohms, who then panic. Defending themselves has drastic consequences. If the drugs lost it before, who boy, are they going ape shit now? Their whole existence is at risk. Now shit's gonna get real. There's gonna be months of negotiation, possibly a war, and they're probably gonna have to- There's only one solution. Neither the Ohms nor the drugs want to destroy themselves. We must somehow make peace. Or a quick peace. The drugs prove that they are more intelligent than mankind, when even in the midst of a panic, they're able to make peace with what they fear and preserve themselves. They also claim that the Ohm's ancestors on the ancient planet Terra were quite intelligent. Of course, since they may have destroyed their entire civilization, I doubt that's correct. From that point on, the Ohm's are allowed to study drug knowledge. And the drugs in turn value the vitality and innovation that the Ohm's have to offer. The fantastic planet is reserved for the drugs, but the Ohm's build an artificial satellite for themselves, which they name Terra after their own lost homeworld. The end. I did actually read the book this movie was based on, Ohms en Série, or Ohms in Series, which is a lovely little electrical pun. The movie is pretty faithful to the book, especially in its focus on plot with little or no character development. But where the movie excels is in its original pieces, especially the little world-building vignettes. This is Hieronymus Bosch meets Theodore Geisel, although now that I think about it, it's not really that much of a stretch. But this Dr. Seuss has teeth. It's as if the creators of this film had all these great ideas for crazy little living things and then went and found this book to hang them on. Yes, the animation is balls, but the art is baller. Some of the facial expressions are gold. Its realistic style helps the fantastical elements seem ordinary. Its simplistic, even childish qualities, combined with the rudimentary animation, give it a mythic quality. They clearly only animated it as much as they had to, yet it allowed them to make exactly the movie they could, without the cost of special effects. And if you want to talk rudimentary, 1970s special effects were that. This is pre-industrial light and magic Star Wars stuff, and even that doesn't hold up anymore, really. Animating science fiction films in the 1970s then became a thing for this very reason. Finally, creating the non-Disney animation industry for adults that Ralph Bakshi dreamed of. Fantastic Planet has been seen as a metaphor for racism, animal rights, and just about every authoritarian regime. On the surface, it is an indictment of anthropocentrism. And once we see the non-human is lesser, it's easy to indulge in the ethnic narcissism of categorizing some of us as less human. 
The movie's overt animal rights themes therefore meld easily into human and civil rights. This production being delayed for several years by the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia made it especially relevant for its time, and still relevant to ours. If only our problems were as easily solved with rocket ships and an artificial moon. Thanks for hanging out with me as I lose my voice and the sun goes down on the back row. I'm really looking forward to seeing your comments on this video, and I'm especially talking to you, Wayne Boulier, and Alan Walker, and Donnie Johnson, and Grassy Noel One, and Gothic Child Creations, and everyone who has subscribed in the past month or two, you are blowing me away. If you're thinking about joining our burgeoning community, it's easy. Just comment or subscribe. If you want to get listed in one of these videos, go to patreon.com slash dianagenta, sign up there, and I'll put your name up on the small screen. I'm Diana Genta. Next up, we've got family and personal favorite, The Wicker Man. See you at midnight. I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden. Along with the sunshine. It's gotta be a little pain sometime. Hey, if you liked this video, make sure you click subscribe or ring the bell or stroke the magic unicorn, whatever it is, wherever you're watching wants you to do in order to be notified of new videos. Speaking of new videos, make sure you check out my Patreon page. I've got everything I've made posted there, and a donation of even a couple or five bucks a month can really make a difference between me having to work my day job all the time, or having the free time to make you more fun shit to brighten your day. You can also find me on social media, and thank you for encouraging my behavior. Have a great day. I should probably get around to making an Instagram account, or Insta, is that what the cool kids are calling it these days? Anybody? Ha <laughs> ha